Hello everybody, my name is Paul Buitink and welcome to this special English edition of our weekly show about Bitcoin, freedom and more. Co-host is Job Hartog and our guests today are Otto de Voogd and Robert Reindeer Nederhoed. Otto is a digital freedom warrior and a member of the non-profit Internet Society Estonia chapter and a volunteer Mozilla contributor. He's being sued by the Estonian government for trading small amounts of Bitcoin. He's now back in Holland. And Robert Reinder, he owns BitMyMoney.com, where you can buy and store Bitcoin. He has a new wallet that he will demonstrate in today's show. Before we start, let me remind the viewers that you can ask questions uh, through the Q&A tool. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this channel on YouTube and follow us on Google+, Plus so you never miss, miss a single episode. Job, um, as always, uh, we start with the highlight of the week in Bitcoin land. Must be Microsoft, right? Um, yeah, it's hard to uh, read something. Anything else than Microsoft today, so I guess we uh, keep the big thing. But yeah, um, I think it's really big actually. Microsoft is coming out now just in America right now uh, on two of their platforms that you can accept Bitcoin. Um, it's on the Xbox platform and on the app platform, if I understand it correctly. And they aim to be soon uh, at more countries and uh, get more of the parts of Microsoft integrated in Bitcoin payments. Um, what I want to stress is why I think this is really important. Um, they accept Bitcoin now on their gaming platform. And I think that's the first gaming platform that's really um, open to accept Bitcoin. So now it's really interesting to see what Steam, uh, PlayStation, and all the other guys are going to do in the couple of, uh, next couple of months. Especially I'm a gamer, I own all of those consoles, and right now if I have to buy a game, well, I, I know which platform I'm going to choose. Excellent. Yeah, hopefully it will um, motivate the others to uh, to join uh, Microsoft as well. Well, I hope so, and especially Steam. It's a big uh, big platform for a lot of Bitcoin users, but they still don't accept Bitcoin. So I hope they uh, will be very fast after Microsoft now. Uh, great. Well, that was uh, definitely positive news. Uh, the price hasn't uh, responded that much. Um, uh, I guess we're just sort of used to, to some of these big uh, platforms to start accepting Bitcoin by now. Um, but uh, Otto, uh, Robert, you have an opinion on that? I think it's great. Yeah. <laughs> Any example I can use uh, internationally or in the Netherlands, it's, it's good. Awesome. It, it's kind of funny that uh, the mother company of Skype which is uh, Estonia's pride, has now decided to accept Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, let's talk and uh, talk about Estonia with you in more detail, Otto. Um, so uh, welcome uh, to the show, first of all. Thank you. You lived in, uh, you're Dutch, just like all of us, but uh, mm -hmm. you lived in Estonia <laughs> for, for 10 years before fleeing the country recently and returned to Holland. Before we talk about the reasons why you left, um, namely the government's suing you and harassing you uh, just because you trade some Bitcoin. How did you end up there in the first place? Uh, it's kind of a long story, um, but when I moved there, uh, Estonia seemed like a very vibrant place and uh, it was um, developing very fast and uh, it didn't have uh, too many, you know, legacy systems holding it back, yeah? So there was... Um, potential for uh, for adoption of uh, of new things and they basically skip whole phases that that uh, other countries still had to get rid of so for instance banks never sent uh, paper um, um, uh, uh, bank statements it was always uh, online or by email there are whole phases that they skipped um, because they came in later so they jumped into um, doing everything internet-based, if possible, and um, yeah. So I had the impression that it was a very um, dynamic country that it wanted to um, to embrace the future. It was also appears to be uh, very uh, liberal in its uh, economic um, um, system, and it has it has a actually quite a simple uh, tax system as well. Um, so yeah, a, a lot, lots of things just look very good. Then of course I also have an Estonian, at the time, girlfriend. Ah, that's the real reason. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that helped. And But before that we lived uh, together in Holland for uh, several years. So in, in 2005 uh, we just decided we would try um, uh, spend some time in Estonia. 
and it went quite well until um, beginning of this year. Yeah, and, and what about the, some of the crisis years? Because you had a huge real estate bubble that burst uh, too. Yeah, and, yes. Um, you guys foolishly joined the Euro a few years ago. I don't know what that's all about, but what, how, how well, did... Well, uh, maybe there shouldn't be a discussion about the Euro, but let's <laughs> say that for, uh, for Estonia it made sense. Right. And so uh, un until this year everything was fine. Um, can you tell me a bit more yeah, about, I... about your background and what you were doing there and, and, and what happened earlier this year? Uh, okay, that's lots of well. Um, I was always uh, myself in IT. I, I had my own little company and was doing uh, um, different uh, jobs for different uh, customers. Uh, I tried to do it for customers in Holland mostly, but um, uh, that's difficult from afar. So about two years ago, I, I went to work for a Finnish software company, where I was a system analyst uh, working on uh, banking software. Um, and um, Bitcoin was just a hobby and something I did on the side and um, I remember that I got very excited about Bitcoin first uh, used some I, I, I you know I had this created this wallet and there was a faucet at the time and I got like five Bitcoin cents or something which in today's money is worth quite a lot but at the time it wasn't and they you know, played around uh, with it and then sent it back to the faucet and I thought hey this is really cool you know so uh, so then I bought some bitcoins for twenty dollars at the time uh, which was I think ten bitcoins for twenty dollars and um, I thought well this you know uh, it works it's easy you can just uh, you know send money from the command line or for a simple graphical uh, inter user interface uh, so I immediately felt the potential and then um, uh, what I basically realized is that this probably it works the same way for other people you just have to try it you know and so I <clears throat> I talked to people about Bitcoin and I said oh, I don't know how do I get some and so eventually I thought yeah well I can help you with that you know so um, uh, um, I just um, basically I just wanted to help friends uh, get a few bitcoins um, here and there and with time of course it was also friends of friends because then they would tell their friends you know um, in the beginning of course there weren't very many transactions the first year that I did this I think I I helped three people <laughs> And when was the first yeah. year? When was the year was then? <laughs> that was in um, 2011, I think. So you know, some uh, uh, people who just wanted to to get 25 uh, euros worth of bitcoins or something like that. I think the biggest transaction in that year was 100 euros. <laughs> but it was just to try, you know. People wanted to try. Right and. Uh, and and I, I just wanted to help them get started because I like the technology and I'm like well you got to just try it and kind of touch it and maybe not the correct word but you know what I mean um, uh, and then you understand it so um, basically um, well, as we all know uh, the, the price is rather volatile so it's always really a bit bit hard to say like okay I'll sell you some bitcoins for what's the price and so on because it changes all the time so so I had um, devised my own um, uh, algorithm to calculate the price based on uh, the the current market um, in the beginning at Mount Gox <laughs> if you remember <laughs> so I just took their market data API and then uh, crunched that and then I I used a different formula I just said how much would it cost to buy you know uh, 50 bitcoins there at the time the price was like two dollars uh, so it doesn't make that much difference and so I, I so I wrote this all in JavaScript and everything and then I made just a page where I could show my price easily right and, and, I, and, and what happened then well and then um, at around the same time I also discovered that the domain name btc.ee was free you know and if you and if you believe that uh, Bitcoin is the future, as I already did then, then I felt like, well, you know, I can't 
let this opportunity pass. So I just bought it, and um, and then it made lots of sense to just put my uh, JavaScript on there um, and write a short introduction about uh, Bitcoin and, and how to um, buy or sell them. So that's what I did. <laughs> it's really, you know, nothing extremely big. I would say uh, it was like having your um, uh, having a local uh, local Bitcoin um, listing, except on your own site. Right, and then the fast forward uh, earlier this year, what 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 happened then? So um, in, in February, uh, middle of February, I got an email from Sir. They first email just said, uh, "Maybe we want to talk to you about what you're doing." So I. Replied, yeah, fine. Uh, when uh, you know, I can come uh, like on Friday, like a few days uh, later. But uh, and then I asked him some questions, like, um, could you know, because I would really like to know what what is Bitcoin in the in the legal sense. Uh, the fact is that in December, um, the year before, there there was. A, a request by an exchange company in Estonia uh, to uh, to ask what Bitcoin is exactly, because nobody really knew. State hasn't uh, published anything, so then I thought, well, if they want to talk to me, they might as well answer these questions and tell me, you know, what Bitcoin is, I mean, because it could be a commodity, it could be currency, it could be just a consumption product in their from their point of view. Uh, how my, you know, how can we know? And basically, um, they didn't give a, a clear answer, or at least this policeman didn't give a very clear answer. Um, and instead, um, he started to, uh, uh, you know, send me um, excerpts of the law and saying, "Oh, you have to get a license if you trade Bitcoin, and if you didn't trade Bitcoin with a license, then uh, you risk thirty-two thousand euro fine and three year in prison." And and then my attitude obviously immediately changed. That was like, um, uh, really? So um, so when do you actually need a license? Is it when you, you know, if it's just at this hobby level, or is it, you know, when is something a, a hobby, uh, and when is something a business? Yeah. Right. And what did what did the law say? Because I I'm sure the law didn't say anything specifically about Bitcoin. Uh, right? There's no the word Bitcoin, a cryptocurrency, or or a virtual. Uh, uh, currencies which are used by the European Central Bank doesn't ever appear in any law, and neither in any, uh, you know, publicized uh, interpretation. Saying like, you know, I would expect them to say, uh, I would have expected the police and all the other um, government agencies to sit around and decide what Bitcoin is, and then and, and publish that fact. Right. right, but he but he referred to the law. So what kind of which part of the law did he refer? Did the police okay, refer so, to? Okay, uh, so the the law they referred to was a law called the uh, um, alternative payment methods, yeah, law, which was a law aimed at uh, basically killing uh, uh, e-gold at the time. And um, I happen to know a person in Estonia who was running an e-gold exchange. And they had stopped uh, their business uh, when this law uh, became law, basically. Um, but then, yeah, e-gold is an entirely different thing uh, to Bitcoin. I mean, first of all, e-gold is e-gold is centralized. Um, you know, there is uh, um, there's central control over over the system. Uh, assets are uh, are freezable. Um, Traceable, uh, all kinds that you can do with that, and actually, yeah, the, there is a person engaged in transferring the e-gold from one account to another. So I don't know. Right, and then the police wanted different. to have a, a bit of a different chat with you, and they start th started threatening you with uh, yes. jail and fines. So, and, and what was your response? Well, so then, um, so then, as it happened, the date that I had proposed to, to talk to them, they couldn't. <laughs> so that fell through, and then um, uh, they asked if we could 
uh, put a new date and I said yes yeah, sure we can put a new date but could you first tell me and then I asked them you know some questions oh, well, so uh, yeah where is this threshold between hobby and Bitcoin what is Bitcoin legally where does a Bitcoin transaction take place why do you think you have authority over a website hosted hosted in the United States etc etc so I asked them all these questions and some things they answered and some things they didn't like the why do you think you have authority over a website hosted in the United States? They said, oh, well, you have an, you know, it's in Estonian, they said. And then I said, actually, it's not in Estonian, it's in English, but there's an Estonian translation. Well, if you click on the S link, then you get an Estonian translation. And they said, yeah, well, in our view, that means it's in Estonian and blah, blah, blah. And I don't know. I mean, they could, they could also argue that you are based in Estonia, so on, on, on the basis of that, you're the operator based in Estonia, so it's Estonian. Or that was not an argument they, they used. Well, they, they said that the domain name was registered to me and that I live in Estonia. Yeah, right. they also said that. So, as you can see, um, I, I basically listened very carefully to their arguments and then negated them all. So, I removed Estonian from my website. I removed myself from Estonia. So, <laughs> you know. But, I, but if you come back to Estonia now, I mean, I'm sure you have your family there, right? So if you go back there, are you going to be um, picked up from the airport and escorted to a, to, a, to a court, or what's going on? No, I don't think so. Well, first of all, um, th there's actually a tiny correction to your introduction that I should probably make, and that is that um, I sued the police. Okay, so it's a, okay, that's, that's quite an important difference. <laughs> now, uh, it's not them suing me and they didn't charge me with anything, but the reason I sued them is that after they issued this threat with the 32,000 euros and three years in prison, they sent me a kind of warrant, uh, which they call a precept. Now, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know all the, the, the fine little details of what the difference is between these things. But I think most people understand the cons warrant and it's something like that. And this was a, a warrant demanding information from me. So I thought that this is really funny. So first you threaten me and say that I, you were trading without a license, but we don't actually have the information proving that. So could you please give it to us? <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, uh, no. <laughs> So, um, um, so then, of course, um, you know, I thought uh, uh, I thought it's it's a ridiculous that you ask me uh, this information to incriminate myself based on what you have said. You know, I mean, in most countries, in most uh, uh, democratic countries, there is some rule against self-incrimination. So, if they think that I committed a crime by trading bitcoins then uh, uh, I shouldn't be the I shouldn't have to uh, supply them uh, or testify against myself it's ridiculous so and anyway and then you sued them in, instead of so they arrest you they threatened you with a fine and jail well, yeah. and giving you information and then as a, as a countermeasure you decided to sue them yeah and then but then of course I used also but this is one of the arguments why I wanted to do that but the, uh, the main argument that I used was that well you, you know, nobody knew your uh, interpretation of the law. Nobody. I didn't know it. Nobody knew it. At some point in time, the police must have sat around the table and had a meeting and decided, uh, which laws apply to Bitcoin? And then they must have come to a conclusion. Well, when um, you come to that conclusion, publish it. Why keep it secret and wait for some uh, somebody to, to step in, you know, to fall in their trap? Right, so what, what do you think are the ulterior motives then? Because on the one hand, we see, Esto um, um, we see Estonia being this liberal country and they give, give away e-residencyship cards to guys like uh, Tim Draper from the States. And they, they try to um, promote themselves as a very liberal haven where businesses can flourish and, 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 and you name it. But on the other hand, you are being um, built, uh, threatened like this and we also see VAT being being applied yeah. to Bitcoin completely. So what's this kind of a schism there between uh, being liberal and being old KGB-like? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Yes, um, actually, it's a really good question, and and I don't really have a a a, uh, a definitive answer. I've heard many different things, and I do have some say things that I feel are are happening. Um, so one of the things that I feel is that the the, the Estonian state is just paranoid, and um, this is one example of paranoia. You know. Uh, like all states, basically, right? Because we see it with Snowden, but also in Holland and in England. It's, 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 I, it's I, I don't think all of the Dutch state is very paranoid compared to other countries. <laughs> Actually, I think they're they're, you know, in in it seems to me that in Holland the state is like, oh well, do whatever the hell you want as long as you pay taxes, <laughs> it's fine, and um, and and they just let people. Uh, at least my impression is that they let people go around uh, doing their own business more or less, but except you have to pay for everything. But <laughs> and you're back in Holland now, right? How do you um, how do you experience the Bitcoin community in Holland? Uh, the Bitcoin community here is just absolutely fantastic. So uh, uh, you know, full of energy, and uh, there's so many people working on things, and uh, so many ideas. And um, I've been to Arnhem a few times already. And I'm absolutely impressed. It's great. So um, I'm actually looking to um, go live there. <laughs> Seriously, because of Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's right. I think this is. Just, I hope uh, they usually uh, also listen to the show. So Annette, if you're uh, listening, um, because of you guys, uh, you get the first uh, uh, yeah, Bitcoin fugitive. Bitcoin in Bitcoin. In uh, Annette. You should open a Bitcoin refugee center in Arnhem yeah. because yeah. <laughs> yeah, like that, yeah. yeah. Or a bed and breakfast for Bitcoin. Yes, yes. yes. B &B &B. But um, yeah, I, I think that um, that I would be quite uh, happy there, and um, I, I actually have a historical connection to Arnhem as well because my grandparents lived there. So when I was a kid, I went back to Arnhem. Uh, uh, at least uh, once a year, because I lived in Africa and France uh, yeah, during my youth. And whenever we went to Holland, then um, then we went to Arnhem. So, but Dave yeah. passed away already, so uh, a few years ago. Oh. Okay. Oh, Annette just says in the in the Q and A um, tool that you're very welcome, Otto. So um, she's, she's thank you, indeed, Annette. Uh, Listening live to the show. Okay, well, talking about uh, great Dutch initiatives, uh, let's let's go to our next uh, guest. Uh, it's Robert Reindeer Nederhut. <laughs> <laughs> I like your pronunciation. <laughs> yeah, so you're you're one of the regulars on the show. It's uh, I think your third time, but um, you have great news for us because you've developed a new wallet and you're going to um, to showcase uh, the new wallet. Um, may, maybe tell a little bit more first um, about yourself and your company before you start um, demonstrating your your wallet. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we started the company in 2012, and we started with uh, a payment solution which was used in Delft as the first hub in the Netherlands to accept Bitcoin. Then a few months later, we um, I actually did the same as Otto did, providing a, a ticker for the Bitcoin price we would offer, and then people could pay with Ideal. A few months later, you could also sell your bitcoins to us, and then about a year ago, we were deciding um, on well, what's next? What's the next step? And um, um, in Den Haag, there's already already the Bitcoin Boulevard, and what we noticed was that a lot of people were interested in seeing the event, but uh, found it a, a hurdle to really use Bitcoin themselves, just to to buy them and to carry them with them and to pay in a pub. Um, so most of the, in the initiatives we currently see are, um, well not most, but a lot of the, the startups are focusing, focusing on the Bitcoin literate. Even, for example, Blocktrail is, is really targeting big businesses, um, experienced Bitcoin users. And we're we kind of decided to go the other route and seek uh, a solution for the, well, 75% of the Dutch people who have heard of Bitcoin but are reluctant to really step in and start using it. And the way to go was to uh, uh, offer an online solution first and then try to get people on their mobile with, uh, with a simple 
easy to use, secure Bitcoin wallet. Well, I can't say wallet. I should say account. Account, yeah. Is that uh, otherwise you'll be sued too, or? <laughs> no, I won't be sued. <laughs> I've been asked to say account because people say a wallet implies that you carry your own bitcoins, and in this case, we guard the bitcoins for you. Okay, Thanks. so yeah, your marketing spin masters have um, have asked you to use the word account instead of. No, no, no. It's actually Bitcoin users <laughs> on Facebook. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that's yeah. Okay, perfect. Well, maybe you know them. <laughs> yeah, but well, the proof the, the proof of pudding, is, pudding is in eating. So uh, um, let's just um, see how your uh, new wallet looks like, and and perhaps you can while showing the wallet, you can tell us whether it's already available for everyone and stuff like that. Okay, I see you've got five minutes. I think that should that should suffice. We've kept everything super simple. You all see Yot now on my screen. I think. Whoa. This is better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I'll give you the focus. Okay. So yeah, you have to focus now. Okay. Everything is. Um, everyone can see. Looks great. <clears throat> okay. This is the front page, and we're currently uh, targeting Europe, but we start with the Netherlands. So we have a Dutch version, um, but for the English use, I'll switch to English. A simple secure account for your bitcoins. That's did my money well. Then we try to convince you about. Why we're really cool. <laughs> yeah, put some women on your front page. I can see it. Yep. Excellent. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe show the topless next time for him. <laughs> Do you also see this? Getting started is easy. Um, yeah, we see a cup of coffee. No, no, okay. Okay, that didn't work. Well, I've. I've um, one second. Whoa. Who's that? Screen share. Buy a screen. This is better. Okay, now see you see a desktop, right? Yeah. Getting yeah, started. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. So if you register, this this point I'm reg registered as test at bitmymoney.com, which is a new user. So you have no bitcoins, no euro value. You get it, an explanation how you can start buying bitcoins. But the first time you click buy, at this point we only support ideal, so the first customers will be Dutch customers. You could say, well, I would like to have 25 euros in Bitcoin, select your bank, and you can buy Bitcoins. If you want to buy a, a larger amount, um, we would ask you to stay below a certain level because the first payment has to be a small payment. This is due to um, abuse of ideal, not with us, but with bank accounts of customers. So we've been asked to apply limits to uh, first customers. Is that clear? Yeah, but you said it's only the first time, right? So That's what happened after the first time? The second, the second time you can buy up to 200 euros. Uh, if you can buy more, but then I will. Then will you will need to verify your mobile. And then if you buy more, the first time I will call you, or my, my support will call you, or probably me, and I'll say, is everything all right? Yes, it's all right. And then I can let, uh, I can, I can, uh, uh, how could say, give you the limits to buy up to a thousand euros of bitcoins per transaction. So if you're, if you're a small user, you only need an email address and a mobile phone, and you can start using us. If you want to buy more than uh, like a thousand euros of bitcoins a day, then uh, some extra security measures apply. Yeah. So, what kind of things do you have to provide as a user if you wanna if you wanna buy more than that amount, like a thousand uh, or two thousand a day? Well, you can buy up to five thousand euros a day, and after that, you will need to upload a, a, a identity papers. Right. Just a, okay. just a standard documents. Okay. Yeah. But that's that's just after the five thousand euros, right? Total amount right. transferred through your so system. It's a daily limit. And we have a, a safety limit of thousand euros per transaction. But the thing is we're not targeting we're not targeting investors. No. We can serve we can uh, facilitate trades for investors, but then we would have more personal contacts. And if you're an active trader you can go to uh, to one of the Dutch uh, exchanges. It's far easy far more easy for you, I think. Right. I got a question um, uh, from um, Wouter Meyer, uh, Robert Reinders. So you keep the customers' Bitcoin. 
Are customers legally secure to get their money back in case you lose the customers' bitcoins? We're, we're not legally uh, secured at the moment. We keep like over 95% of the bitcoins offline in cold storage. Um, it's it's on our list just to get to get into place in 2015 to get a, get a insurance um, for if something happens well to the website then um, well to your customers bitcoins then we can provide them with the, the amount we lost but we have we have all the bitcoins currently online are our own like company bitcoins Right, and um, how many um, customers, is this already open to the wide audience or is yeah, this just... Yeah, we've, uh, uh, we've well, launched silently four weeks ago to the existing customers. Uh, that means people who bought Bitcoins with us in the past one and a half year. Um, and like I think 25% of them have already opened their account and a lot, many of them have also, also bought Bitcoins into their account. So I'm quite satisfied. Right, and what are you going to do to make this mainstream? Um, good question. Well, I, I wanted to demonstrate something also, but not that. Not uh, <laughs> Not gateway. Not gateway. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm terrified. That's <laughs> yeah, all life, eh? So one of the, the, the disadvantages, disadvantages of the current version is that if you want to send bitcoins you still have this ugly bitcoin address you see and oh, next week <laughs> I'm sorry no never mind yeah it's not ugly but it's it's uh, ugly for a newcomer yeah I'm especially like, most people they already complain about the complexity of IBAN numbers let alone uh, bitcoin strings yeah we need uh, some kind of DNS names for that in the future oh this is cool but anyway this <laughs> It's stirring compete as well, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is better, right? Yeah. Uh, but next week, we launched a version where you can choose to send bitcoins to uh, um, to an email address instead of a, instead of a bitcoin address. Cool. Nice. Well, great. Yeah. Um, we are I, running out of time. Uh, maybe uh, job, yeah, uh, last question for uh, yeah. For do you provide any in intelligence to your customers? Like, if they put, uh, let's say, for instance, there is a big trader on your platform, and they would like stuff ten thousand euros of of Bitcoin in in your wallet. Do you mm -hmm. advise them then at that amount to uh, reconsider their security on Bitcoin? So, like, for instance, you're not, what you said is you are not targeting targeting the big guys, and are targeting yeah. like my my mom. And I actually would love her to try this one to see if she's able to uh, to figure this out. Mm -hmm. Do you provide anything of, of hey, for after this amount, maybe it's time to look into the security to get your Bitcoins in the cold storage? Uh, not currently, but we would. And at, at the moment, you cannot even deposit Bitcoins with us. So it's oh, you can, can only like buy with euros and then set it on the account. Maybe. You cannot send yeah. Bitcoins in from the outside. Um, one second. Yeah, maybe you should show, you show your face again, Robert, because we're rounding up anyway. Okay, sorry. I was depositing myself just to show in the, in the screen. I just sent on like five euros into into the account, which is uh, now deposited. Um, oh. And I'll uh, how do I get back to the screen. I uh, just uh, at at the at, uh, left menu, you just uh, stop screen sharing. Just click on the screen share button again. I oh guess. yeah, there we are. Oh, okay. There we go. Yes. There we are. Yes. Okay. Um, well, yeah, if your mother can use it, that's like the ultimate. Um, test. That's the ult uh, Trust me, that's the ultimate test case. If my mother can use this stuff, then it's uh, becoming at least uh, one level. Uh, so we would rather have a thousand your uh, users with ten euros than one user with ten thousand euros. That's the motto. Right. Well, it sounds really good, uh, Robert, and uh, we wish you all the best. Yeah. So where can people um, uh, open a wallet? I mean, you already s says in your name new dot my. Uh, yeah, new dot bitmymoney.com. There it is. Yeah. Okay. Well, I advise everyone to take a look and um, and try out this uh, this new wallet. Um, and then. Yeah. And uh, Otto, where can we find your? Uh, I read you were uh, crowdsourcing your Sue in Estonia or your higher appeal. Higher appeal. Yeah. You? 
Well, on btc.e, there is a link to my appeal. That's the easiest, and there's some information if uh, people want to help. That would be nice. And basically, um, I understand that uh, if I win in the end, which is the chance is quite uh, uh, big, I think, because my lawyer found out that uh, the Estonian law is actually <coughs> in violation of European law. And then I, I think that it's just a matter of time that you win uh, in court. Yeah. So the lower court just simply ignored this argument and didn't even address it, didn't even say why it wouldn't be valid. That's going to be a little bit harder for an appeals court, even harder for the Supreme Court. And as soon as you get to a European court, then suddenly I'm no longer a foreigner in the European court, you know. So um, um, I would say that there's a fair chance, that the chance is only getting bigger that I win. But if I win, I get some refund, and then I basically refund uh, everybody who donated. And if I lose, then everybody loses their money. Though. <laughs> so How much do you need, Otto? How much does I, it cost? It's a, at this point in time, it's a guess. The first uh, phase... Uh, uh, cost me 4,500 euros, this lawyer fees alone. Uh, I mean, actual costs are of course bigger. I, I moved countries, uh, quit my job, etc., etc. But just lawyer fees. It was 4,500 euros. Um, and I guess it's going to be something similar. That's all. The thing, of course, is that the arguments have already been made and written down, so maybe it's cheaper. I, it's, it's hard to say. Right. Well, all the best with that, and um, let us know uh, maybe in a few months or so um, how it all went, and perhaps you can come yeah. back in the show. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you. And, uh, Thanks, guys. See you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.